pain will make an island of you. And you'll find that you're living there all by yourself. And you'll find that you're all alone in that. And so when it comes to the experiences of women, and if, I don't know if you've heard this term before, but cisgender, it means a woman or a person that is not trans, cis. And so the experiences of women have been pushed onto an island. And the thing is, when you've been pushed onto an island, the question should be, how do I get off this thing? How did we get here? And instead, so many people, people like J.K. Rowling that is trying, that thinks that, the, that what they're doing is creating more inroads for pain is actually protecting the island instead of trying to get off of it. And now you're defending the island from other women who have had experiences like yours. Do you understand what I'm saying? That instead of interrogating how it is that women came to be on this island of experience, under all the stigma and misogyny and hate, which all exists, and the attack on women's bodies when it comes to abortion rights, when it comes to access to health care, we know that these things are true. And instead of interrogating why it is that women are on this island of, of experience, people like J.K. Rowling are defending it. And they're defending the island because they think that they're defending the experience. And that's what I mean when I say, beware the narcissism of sorrow. It will make you think that what you're doing is one that is transformative. But in fact, it is when you disappear yourself into the story that you're given, because the truth is nobody can understand the experiences of cis women like trans women. That the experience of trying to come into your own self, into your femininity in a world that despises you more often than not, that despises your body, that despises your femininity, these things are all connected and we are all connected. But if we allow our sorrow to make an island of us, we will never ever find each other. And if we do not find each other, it means that the kinds of change that we desperately need in this country now and in our own lives, it makes it impossible. And so we have to claw back out of the clutches of our suffering and tie our fate to that of another. I'll give you another example. I have a friend and he's white and I love him very much. And in a moment when we were uh, working out together, I could see uh, because he had made a comment around my uh, athleticism, I could see that he was working through something in his body. And so he said to me, is it true? Is it, is it, do you think it's true that uh, black people are more muscular, or more athletic? Now, there's a lot of associations that are connected to that idea and to that thought, yes? this idea that black people are inherently physically superior. And we know what they are, and they've been used to justify the worst kinds of brutalization in this country. They've been used to say that we are in fact inferior intellectually, as if to say, we'll give you this physical prowess, but the intellectual remains within this project of whiteness. And so it is, that is why that is why in this moment, in this moment that we're in, we have children, children that are being killed by police who do not see them as children, boys and girls, Tamir Rice and Ayanna Stanley Jones, kids, teenagers like Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin. And they're never seen as the children that they are. They're never cared for as the children that they are. And that's because people say, well, look at the size of them. Or little girls, little black girls that are expelled sooner than their peers at astronomical rates, or that little girls, little black girls that are sexualized. These things happen because of a thought like that. And this friend, this friend, he knows he knows better and something very important happened after he said that. He said it, he said, 
Is it true? Do you think it's true that black people are just more athletic and muscular than everyone else? And immediately after he said it, he caught himself. And he said, no, that isn't true. That's exactly why all these terrible things happen. It's what's used to justify it. And I'll tell you why he was able to do that. It's because he was able to move through the feelings of inadequacy that came up in him in that moment. And this is important. Because if you are so caught up in your own sorrow and your feelings of inadequacy and your feelings of inferiority in a system that was designed to make you feel small and invisible, when we give ourselves over to that, we find that we're actually, fr when we're fragile, we can't handle any kind of challenge. And so that is a person who caught himself because he had built enough relationships with people like me because he was able to look past the training that he had received. He was able to look past his own heart and his own feelings of insecurity and look at the truth of the matter. And I'll tell you what, we know what happens when that work does not happen because we get an Amy Cooper, the white woman who called the police on Christian Cooper, a black man who was bird watching in New York. You see in the moment that Christian Cooper said in the moment that he said, could you please leash your dog? Amy felt inadequate. She felt small. And instead of interrogating that, instead of looking into that, instead of examining that and looking into herself, she raged. And in raging and in throwing a tantrum, she almost killed a man because she called the police and she said that there is an African-American man that is threatening me because she knew, she knew that she could do that. And she knew to hide behind the veneer of the project of whiteness. But you see, when we hide ourselves, we lose who we are, we forfeit who we are. And then we become weak. And I'm going to tell you something about complacency. Because that's what it means when we're no longer growing inside, when we're no longer pushing ourselves. Complacency is the death of the soul. Complacency locks us in to something lesser than what we are, smaller than who we are. And so we have to move past and move through the complacency because here's the thing with the soul, it can always be revived, it can always be regenerated. But you have to grow and you have to make yourself uncomfortable and you have to find your voice. I'll give you another example around the narcissism of sorrow, this idea, of these feelings of inadequacy, these feelings of inferiority. And I know that you all feel them because I have them too. I have learned those things. I was taught those things about myself. And so I look at the case around um, Ayanna Dior, a black trans woman, a black trans woman who was out on the streets in Minneapolis fighting for George Floyd and fighting for Breonna Taylor and fighting for black people. And she was jumped. She was jumped by a group of men because she was a trans woman. And this is it right here. And this is what I need you to understand about the narcissism of sorrow and how it stops us from building together. You see, those men, most of whom were black, who have done the same thing that every other kind of man in the world does, those men, they felt like Ayanna Dior was some sort of obstacle to their own liberation. They couldn't see past their own hurt and pain. And when you can't see past your own hurt and pain, instead of using that pain to build with somebody, you use it as a bludgeon. 